Uh, what I want to talk to you about today is the modern relevance of Hayek's book, The Road to Serfdom, which was published in 1944. Now, it may be the case that it has been over 30 years since the collapse of communism in Eastern and Central Europe. And in many ways, the failures of socialism that were exposed, not only socialism as it was practiced in fascist Italy, in Stalinist Russia, in Nazi Germany, but also what I want to impress upon you is that although the call for central planning may not be in the air today in the political climate, the aspirations of socialism are alive and well. And that therefore, the lessons that Hayek has for us from the road to serfdom are as relevant as ever. Now, what I want to do is, in effect, outline my presentation in the following way. First, I'm going to provide you with an introduction about how we can think about the modern relevance of the road of, to serfdom today. Because Hayek was writing this book in the context of World War II. So how does it speak to us today? Secondly, I'm going to provide a bit of background and context. The background and context in which Hayek was writing was both an immediate context to respond to British intellectuals at the time who thought that planning was compatible with democracy. But also, the context of this book was a part of a larger project that Hayek never finished called The Abuse of Reason. It has been published in, in pieces, but I'm going to be talking about that as well. Then I will talk a little bit about the road to serfdom and why the argument that Hayek puts forth about the illogical inevitability, the logical in inevitability of totalitarianism coming out of socialism is a tragedy why it was a tragedy. And lastly, I'm going to derive some implications for political economy and liberalism for all of us today. So the fundamental question, you might say, that's framing Hayek's The Road to Serfdom is the following. Is socialism a tragic failure because the wrong people are in charge? Or does socialism fail because it generates the very conditions for the wrong people to become in charge? Let's define our terms for a moment. How was socialism defined then, and how is it defined today? It's an abolition of private property in the means of production. In order to realize the end of advanced material production via the elimination of the wastes associated with capitalism, according to the socialists, and elimination of alienation, amongst the proletariat, amongst the workers of society. So the ends of socialism were economic in nature, to increase advanced material production and to realize social harmony, to benefit the poorest and the least advantages in society. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that the reason why Hayek refers to this as a tragedy is because the ends of socialism, as they were developed at the time, were very well intended. But how is it the utilization of those means, the abolition of private property, the abolition of money prices in the means of production, led to conditions, to results that were completely contrary to the intentions of socialists at the time. Now, the question then becomes, if the answer is socialism is a, is, a trans, is a tragic failure because the wrong people are in charge, that implies that if it wasn't Stalin in charge of Soviet Russia, right? If it wasn't Chavez in charge of Venezuela, and so on and so forth, 
then socialism could realize its ends. But if, in fact, the very incentive structure that is generated by socialism generates conditions where individuals rise to the top that run contrary to the ends of socialism, then that, what that implies is it's the very institutional conditions that generate the wrong people as a byproduct of that system. So another way of, of framing what I'm talking about today is totalitarianism a cause of the failures of socialism or is it a consequence of socialism itself? Now here are some misconceptions of the road to serfdom, even in spite of the way in which Hayek might have talked about the book. What I want you to, get to think about is not to think about it simply as a political book. Indeed, Hayek characterizes the book as a political tract. But it is fundamentally a book that is grounded in economic theory and establishes the conditions for liberalism. So there are two ways to, to read the book, not only as an explanation of the tragedies of socialism, but also about the preconditions for realizing liberalism and a free society. Secondly, Hayek's argument is not what is known as a slippery slope argument. That is, the argument is not if we increase taxes by 10%, we're going to get a totalitarian dictator, right? So his argument is not one of predicting, based upon increasing government intervention, where and when a totalitarian dictator may emerge or totalitarianism emerges. Rather, it's a backward-looking book. What Hayek was attempting to investigate, how is it the fact that intellectual socialists could argue for a system that generated outcomes that they would have been abhorred, high, abhorred by, namely the rise of, for example, Nazi Germany or Stalinist Russia, and so on and so forth. More importantly, the book itself goes beyond explaining the tragedies of socialism. The book is a part of a broader project dealing with the abuse of reason that had arisen as a result of the Enlightenment. That's what he was trying to evaluate. The use of reason came to be understood as a tool by which we could reconstruct institutions. That scientistic hubris, as Hayek referred to it, the use of reason to reconstruct social institutions is what generated the unintended consequences and undesirable consequences associated with socialism. And fourthly, it's a book in political economy with Misesian roots in the background. In other words, in order to understand what Hayek is arguing, the question to keep on the back of your mind is, if central planners, if government officials take a, a, into account Hayek's calculation argument, excuse me, Mises's calculation argument, and nevertheless ignore it, what are the logical implications of ignoring Mises's critique of the impossibility of economic calculation under socialism. Okay? So this is a broader, this is a book that's set in the context of understanding and reviving an understanding of what are the preconditions, both institutional and political, for a free society. So as some background and context, beginning in the 1930s, Hayek was absorbed in a project which he referred to as the abuse and decline of reason. Many of you might be familiar with Hayek's book, The Counter-Revolution of Science, and the subtitle being Critical Studies and the Abuse of Reason. That book 
And the articles that were published in that book, having been published in the 1940s, was only meant to be a, pro a subset of this larger project on the abuse and decline of reason. The Road to Serfdom itself, published in 1944, was meant to be the concluding project of this larger abuse, and reason, abuse of reason project. But as Hayek himself described it, when he began to work on this project, he couldn't, as, as he describes it in letters to Fritz Machlub, a fellow Austrian economist, he says, if I can't fight the Nazis directly, I'm going to fight their ideas. So given the context of World War II, he was driven to publish this work. And it became this popular success in the United States, to his surprise. So that's the immediate context. The immediate context is trying to understand the tragedy that emerged in World War II, these unintended and undesirable consequences of socialism. But the broader context is the abuse and decline of reason caused by the hubris of scientism. Hayek defining scientism as the misapplications of the methods of the natural sciences and applying them to the social sciences. Right? So if we think about any science, what is the nature of science, whether we're natural scientists or social scientists? What we're trying to understand are systematic chains of cause and effect. That's what science is all about. We're trying to reason or understand a set of outcomes in terms of systematic chains of cause and effect. So for example, the if we we know the laws of physics. We know, for example, if you heat water to a particular point, it's going to boil. That's a direct chain of cause and effect, utilizing reason. But what are the unintended consequences of applying human reason to reconstruct institutions directly from human reason so that they are of human design? rather than being of human action, but not of human design. That's the, intel that's the broader intellectual context within which Hayek is writing. So in effect, Hayek is attempting to provide, as a part of this project, right, the, the, the road to serfdom is just a slice of this larger project, trying to rationally reconstruct the intellectual origins of socialism tracing it back to Henry Saint-Simon, who was, who the term socialism is attributed to, which he coined. Now, let me provide some further background and context within which Hayek was making his argument. What was the more immediate context within which he was arguing? Right, at the time in which he was writing, right, the intellectual climate that prevailed in Britain, where he was a professor, Hayek being the took professor in economics and statistics at the London School of Economics, his fellow colleagues in academia, in the British Academy, had believed that socialism was compatible with democracy, hence the feasibility of democratic socialism. So that's the immediate context within which he's writing. He's attempting to respond to the claims that are being made by British intellectuals at the time. Moreover, he was reacting to the idea that fascism, as it had emerged under Mussolini and under Hitler in Italy and in Germany respectively, was seen to be a reaction to the excesses and instability of a, cap of a capitalist system evidenced by the consequences of the Great Depression. Right? That was the understanding of fascism at the time. Let's not forget right, what does, right, when we're talking about the Nazi party, what does it refer to? 
the National Socialist Workers' Party. Okay? So what Hayek was trying to clarify to his fellow British colleagues was that fascism was a manifestation of socialism, not a reaction to capitalism. And here's a quote. This is a quote from E.F. Durbin, who had reviewed Hayek's article, uh, book, The Road to Serfdom, in Economic Journal. What does he say there? We all wish to live in a community that is as rich as possible in which consumers' preferences determine the relative output of goods that can be consumed by individuals and in which there is freedom of association and political association and responsible government. But notice what he says. The reason why we are socialists, that is, he is referring to, in Britain, the reason why the British can adopt socialism is because they are liberal in their philosophy. It's precisely because they are liberal in their political philosophy that they could utilize socialism as a means by which to achieve its stated ends, namely advanced material production, eliminating the wastes of capitalism, and promoting the common welfare amongst the poorest and least advantaged in society. Now, on to the road to serfdom. As I had said before, in order to, un to reconstruct or understand what is driving the political conclusions that Hayek is, is making in the road to serfdom, we have to understand in the background of, an, of his analysis what is he's taking on as his touch, touchstone. One of the mis misconceptions about Hayek with respect to Mises's argument that rational economic calculation under socialism is impossible was that he had argued that it was not impossible, but rather impractical. That misunderstanding has led to the conclusion that indeed, via democratic means, socialism can be adopted. But in fact, Hayek, never having conceded Mises' original argument, was applying Mises' argument to illustrate how the institutional conditions of socialism would not only preclude central planners from achieving their objectives, even under the best of intentions, but to illustrate that the rise of totalitarianism under Stalin or Hitler in, in Nazi Germany and Mussolini in fascist Italy is an unintended consequence of socialism, not a historical accident. How can that be the case? One way to understand this is the instability of the dynamics of interventionism. So imagine as a thought experiment that we have a government official who sees an undesirable state of affairs, one in which the price of milk from their standpoint is too high. Okay? So let's just imagine that there are government officials that are presuming that the price of milk is too high. And what they want to do is to implement a price control in order to make milk more affordable to individuals that are relatively poor. What we know, just using economic analysis, is the following. Quantity, the quantity demanded of milk is going to exceed the quantity supplied. And then a shortage emerges. Okay? Very straightforward. The question becomes, how is a government official going to respond when the real price of milk exceeds the market clearing price? How are they going to respond? Well, Hayek was illustrating how, as a logical conclusion of pursuing the dynamics of interventionism, how the inevitable or the logical outcome that would emerge from the instability of the dynamics of interventionism could lead to totalitarianism. So the price of milk, the real price go, is too high. Well, in what ways can cows be utilized? 
Right? Cows can be utilized for leather. They can be utilized for milk. And milk, in turn, can be utilized to produce cheese. Or it can be used, utilized to produce yogurt. It could be utilized to produce butter. So how might we respond to this price control? Well, we might legislate now instead of legislating further interventions, the planner might say, this is an undesirable outcome. Let's back off from it. Let's eliminate the price control. But if the idea, if the whole presumption of this intervention is to eliminate an undesirable outcome in a free market, the logical conclusion is only for the government official to double down. So now we might set a price control, not just on milk, but on yogurt, and on cheese, and on butter, so that milk can be provided to individuals. Right? Because rather than producing milk, the dairy farmers can sell it in order to be processed into these other things. It's not a part of the price control yet. So now we implement that price control on all those things that milk is used for. How might the official respond? Well, now, because of the price control, now dairy farmers are, in, are disincentivized from utilizing cows in producing milk or cheese or butter or yogurt. What's the alternative use that cows can be utilized for? For their cow hides, right? So now, instead of raising cows for all of these dairy products, now increasing amounts of cows are going to be slaughtered in order for, to produce leather. What do you do in response to the leather? Well, let's now impose a price control on leather because we don't want leather, we don't want cows to be used to build, make leather. We want it to be, remember, what was the original goal? To make milk more affordable. Now the real price of leather goes up as a result of the price control. So what might be the response of the dairy farmers? They might use their land. Instead of raising cows, they might raise pigs. So do we put a price control on pigs? If we put, put a price control on pigs, maybe they'll be incentivized to raise sheep on that land. Ultimately, what might be the logical conclusion? In order for in order to control the production of milk, what do they ultimately have to take control over? The land itself. So notice the logic that I'm pursuing here. The logic is not one of poor intentions. It's, it's based on well-informed in, well intentions or good intentions, but yet the instability of the dynamics of interventionism will call for an official to respond with additional regulations in order to mitigate the unintended consequences of previous regulations. And this is the thought experiment that Hayek had in the back of his mind in order to establish how ignoring the idea that prices are necessary for economic calculation, what, their, what the logical outcome would be of persistently and consistently pursuing that. One, now, this doesn't just have economic implications, it also has social and political implications. What is one of the things that Hayek talks about in The Road to Serfdom? He said to control the means of production is to control the ends that people can pursue. And that to control the means of production not only eliminates economic freedom, but it also eliminates political freedom and human rights. Take, for example, if the state is in control of all the means of production, and you wanted to build a church, 
or a mosque or a synagogue in order to worship your deity? Well, how would you do that in the absence of a market? You would be at the mercy of a government official in order to petition for those resources. So in effect, controlling the means of production places power and discretion in government officials even in the pursuit of one's religious rights. This doesn't mean that in markets, producers might not discriminate against someone, against their religious practice. But in a competitive market, if there's, one dis discrimin if there's discrimination being occurred by a group of consumers, who can the consumers go to? They can go to the competitor. Right? So the nature of the market process indeed creates dependency on producers, but we're not at the mercy of any one single producer. Now, a second cornerstone of Hayek's argument about why, in effect, totalitarianism is a logical consequence of socialism is his argument about why the worst get on top, right? why worst, the worst get on top. Now, in order to understand why the worst get on top, what we have to understand is that different sets of institutions promote different sets of learning. Different sets of institutions promote different patterns of learning. For example, if you are operating within the rules of soccer, what are you going to play? Soccer. Because within that context, given the rules that you are playing by, it is only in that context that you will learn strategies that are applicable and dependent on that context. So you would not see una chilena in an American football context. That strategy makes no sense. Whereas if you're playing baseball, you're going to follow the rules of baseball, and you're going to learn how to play based on those incentives. One way in order to think about Hayek's notion of why the worst to get on top, and the point that I'm making here, I'm building upon an argument established by the economist Peter Becky. And one way to think about this is to apply Hayek's argument within the context of Adam Smith's notion that the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market. Right? So if you go back to, for example, medieval times, an individual who was a barber was also a surgeon. Why? Because to be a barber and a surgeon, you have to be good with your hands. What happened as the, as the population in Europe increased and the extent of the market increased and the demand for medical services and haircuts People specialized. So being a barber or a beautician became a specialized practice, and being a surgeon became a specialized practice. Now apply that same logic to the political sphere. In the market sphere, how do people learn to specialize? They learn to specialize via the demands of consumers, via the price mechanism. The, the price me mechanism guides them in their production decision-making. It will determine the returns of specializing in different practices, different commercial practices. However, if that contextual knowledge that emerges in a price mechanism is absent, right, if the knowledge that people learn from according to the price me mechanism is absent, that does not eliminate competition. Remember, given the presence of scarcity of resources, there will be competition for resources. What is competition? It's a process of conflict resolution. How can we compete for resources? Right? For example, you might not realize this, but you all competed for, for scarce seats today on a first-come, first basis. What's another way that we can compete for resources? 
One way that's prohibited here is that if you wanted a seat, you might bash someone on the head so that you can get the seat, right? But going back to Adam Smith, up to Hayek, what we have to realize is that there is a competitive, yet a peaceful form of competing for resources. That is productive specialization and exchange. So as you increase the scope for voluntary exchange, the market itself, you increase the scope for productive specialization. But that productive specialization is predicated on learning within a particular context. Now, what is the scope of the political sphere? Right? Going back to Max Weber, we know what's the defi definition of government, right? The definition of government is a political authority that has a monopoly on legitimized force. So in effect, if we contract the scope of the market, we contract the scope of learning via economic calculation and expand the scope of the allocation of resources in politics, how will resources come to be allocated? How will people compete for those resources? Well, if government is the realm of force and you increase the scope by which government has increasing discretion over goods and services, then the only logical outcome is that individuals that will be successful, like in a game, baseball or soccer, right? You're, you're successful played based on playing by the rules of the game. But if the scope of government, if the scope of politics is grounded in the use of force, who will be the individuals that will succeed in that environment? Those who can specialize in and learn how to use force unscrupulously, right? There's the old saying from Lord Acton, power corrupts, but absolute power tends to corrupt Absolutely, right? So this is the logic that Hayek is, attempt, is attempting to incorporate. Given the fact that there's scarcity of resources, given the fact that there's competition over resources, and we can't abolish that, if you eliminate the economic knowledge necessary to allocate resources, the only thing that you're left with is political knowledge about how to allocate resources. And when you have competing ends, that can't be reconciled through productive and specialization and exchange, then how do those competing ends get reconciled if, if competition is a process of conflict resolution by force itself? Go back to the thought experiment that I had talked about with price controls on milk. As more and more decision-making is vested over the means of production in government, how are we going to determine which ends to satisfy? Well, it's going to be won out through force. So for Hayek, totalitarianism is neither a consequence of corruption nor historical accident. Rather, these are, right, rather, it's a logical consequence of the institutional incentives of the attempt to transition to a centrally planned economy. So the fact that these, this historical outcome exists is a byproduct of the institutional in incentives. It's not as if because corrupt, corruption would not exist under a socialist system, it would work. Rather, that's, the, that's a byproduct of a socialist system. So what are some implications for political economy and liberalism today? In other words, is the argument that I'm putting forth here today and my framing of Hayek's argument, how is it relevant in societies that are not structured by central planning and that are not totalitarian? In other words, how is it relevant for the case for a free society? In order to understand that, we have to ask ourselves, why can't socialism ever be democratic. And here's a quote. This quote comes from the 1956 preface 
to Hayek's The Road to Serfdom. What does he say there? He says the essence of the liberal position, however, is the denial of all privilege. If privilege is understood in its proper and original meaning of the state, granting and protecting rights to some which are not available on equal terms to another. So the essence of liberalism is the elimination of privileges. What is the source of privilege? Political discretion. And what is the rule of, rule of law? The rule of law is a political principle by which governments are structured in a manner that eliminates political discretion, that eliminates legislation that is intended to benefit one group of individuals at the expense of another. Now, why is it, why is it the case that an absence of the rule of law generates a contraction, a reduction of the scope of competition in the market characterized by productive specialization and exchange and increasing the scope of government discretion. Well, what's the nature of the rule of law? The rule of law, you might say, and Hayek talks about this as an as a instrument of production, an instrument of production in the road of serfdom. That is, when we think of production, we think of particular factors of production, like land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship, right? Land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. But what guides land, labor, and capital towards productive purposes as opposed to unproductive purposes? Well, it depends upon if the law itself is utilized as a factor of production to incentivize individuals in productive purposes. However, what is the nature of discretion? when monopoly privileges are granted to one group of individuals at the expense of another, what happens to the law itself? The law becomes rivalrous. It can't be used simultaneously to the benefit of all. It introduces benefits to one individual, group of individuals, that in turn create a special disadvantage for another group of individuals. If it becomes rivalrous, what does that imply? It becomes a scarce commodity. And like any scarce commodity, what is it going to invite? Competition. So the very nature of discretion itself is anti-democratic. Precisely because it creates a situation in which political officials, in granting concentrated benefits to one group of individuals, spill over costs on the masses of the population. And in turn, inviting competition that undermines productive specialization in exchange and only invites competition that increases the scope of government intervention. So private property is not synonymous with a privilege. Private property is a social liability, not a private privilege. And here's one way to think about the relationship that we can extract, that we can take away from Hayek with respect to the relationship between the rule of law, democracy, and free markets. Right? When we think of economic freedom, we think of a set of institutions like private property and freedom of contract and market pricing according to profit and loss signals. Political freedom itself is oftentimes characterized in terms of democracy, in, in terms of holding elections and a peaceful transition of power. Okay? And economic freedom may be a necessary, but it's not a sufficient condition for political freedom. Moreover, political freedom itself is not a sufficient condition for realizing economic freedom. 
Let me give an, a, an historical example to illustrate the point that I am making. Right? After its independence from the British Empire in 1947, India, ever since its founding, was a democracy. It had democratic elections. But it, it was a country that stagnated in terms of its economic growth from 1947 to 1991, when it began to implement economic reform. But even though they had democracy, why was it inconsistent with economic freedom? Why did it not realize the consequences of economic freedom? Well, taking the inspiration of British intellectuals, right? The intellectual elite of India, where were they trained? In Britain at the time, what did they learn as the way in which to implement and, and, and structure an economic system? Via central planning, what, are the historical, what was the historical way by which resources were allocated in India? Via the Permit Raj. Basically, a mercantilist form of allocating resources where unelected bureaucrats allocated resources via monopoly privileges through licensing. So that was a situation which was democratic in the sense that there were democratic elections. But that by itself did not imply political freedom or economic freedom. What Hayek is, is getting us to think about is that in order to have both economic and political freedom, both are byproducts of the rule of law. That in order for democracy to, def to fulfill its desired outcomes, which is to be accountable to the citizenry, and in order for producers to be accountable or socially liable to consumers, neither can be granted privileges, neither can be granted the discretion to allocate resources in a manner that they don't bear the full cost of their decision making. So why can't socialism ever be democratic? According to Hayek, it can't be liberal nor democratic because the right to private property itself is a social liability. It's not a private privilege. And the, less, the essence of classical liberalism is the den denial of legal and political privileges. And the rule of law implies an absence of political decision-making via discretion. So in order to realize a democratic system, a system in which political officials are accountable to the citizenry, that requires the rule of law. It requires an abolition of privileges. To the extent that privileges exist, it undermines private property in the means of production. <laughs>